Coming up on News 2, Virgin Islands representatives discussed energy challenges with federal partners in Washington, D.C. Monday. What was on the top of that agenda? Classes were canceled after an electrical fire at the Positive Connections Program campus. We'll tell you what happened, as well as an update on when classes should resume. Plus, our latest Crime Stuffers report on how you can help police solve some of the latest crimes and earn a reward in the process. Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining us on this edition of News 2. I'm Sandra Gomancing. Top in this newscast, Virgin Islands representatives discussed our energy challenges with federal partners in Washington, D.C. Monday. That meeting was organized by Delegate to Congress Donna Christensen and the Department of Interior's Office of Insular Affairs. Are short-term solutions on the way? News 2's Erica Bivens spoke with the Congresswoman on Tuesday and brings us the story. The average WAPA customer pays $254 a month for electricity at five times the national average. At the same time, VA unemployment sits at 13 percent, 6 percent higher than the national average. VA officials gave those statistics to federal agencies Monday in Washington, D.C. I thought that it was important for us when the governor was up here in particular to have a special meeting set aside to just deal with what I'm sure everybody agrees is an energy crisis in the Virgin Islands. In addition to Delegate Christensen and Governor DeYoung, WAPA's Director Hugo Hodge, VI Energy Director Carl Knight, and Senate President Sean Michael Malone also attended. The first part of the meeting really focused on making sure that they, one, understood the gravity of our situation, and two, all that we have been doing to address it. And it probably should have been done already, but better late than never. Although Christensen says they discussed short-term solutions, News 2 asked if she thought realistically there would be any relief within the next 18 months. I don't see any reason why uh, out of the programs that are available, we can't get help down to the territory. Christensen is rewriting legislation to help with federal funding, specifically turning loan money under the Department of Agriculture's High Energy Cost Program into a grant. We didn't walk out with a bucket full of money. I think we've made our points and what we did say is that among ourselves we would continue to fine-tune our ass. For News 2, I'm Erica Bivens. Senator Malone issued a release stating the federal government is likely to assist the territory but said officials could make firm commitments Monday due to the pending sequester budget cuts. An electrical fire at the St. Croix Alternative School forced the program to close on Tuesday, according to Department of Education officials who said the fire was reported between midnight to 1 a.m. Tuesday morning. The fire broke out in classroom six in the southern building, completely destroying the room and canceling classes for the day. As a result of an electrical fire in one of our classrooms early this morning, uh, the Secret Alternative Education Program was forced to close. Um, the fire department uh, immediately addressed the situation. Uh, the fire was in one classroom in our southern building. However, it has affected other areas on campus and, and that forced our closure. Uh, we are hoping that we are able to open back to full schedule tomorrow morning. Um, parents should know that they do have work to do for our students in the Positive Connection Center, grades six through eight. Students should go on the Achieve 3000 program and complete online work. And for our Twilight students who are in grades nine through 12, they should, if they have internet access, also be able to go on and complete uh, work online. So when, when they return tomorrow, they will still be on task. According to the Virgin Islands Next Generation Network officials, the next major phase of their broadband project is underway. In a phone conference Monday evening, Lawrence Kupfler said contractors in both districts will begin pulling actual fiber optic cables into underground ducting and connecting them to WAPA utility poles. The government program is building a high-speed fiber optic middle mile network in the territory, which will have unlimited bandwidth for ISPs to buy. To date, Kupfer says $32 million has been awarded, with $2.4 million remaining for construction, which is bringing jobs. Transco and all 
Founder Systems are, is a joint venture that's doing the work, as Larry explained, in the Virgin Islands. Presently, they have 146 interviews for 25 positions, but they are in the process um, of bidding for more work. Depending on how the contracts are awarded, we'll see if that number will increase. Crews that will be pulling fiber through the existing WAPA utility ducts, they anticipate each crew will be about 12 people. Four of those people will be uh, stateside uh, people, and eight will be local hires. Work is underway again in Williams Delight. Contractors resumed road repairs and drainage improvement work in the southwestern section of Williams Delight Monday. Public Works Commissioner Daryl Small said the work is expected to continue through the end of May. He asks for the community's cooperation while the work is moving forward and apologizes for the inconvenience. Motorists are urged to exercise caution and be on the lookout for flagmen and traffic sign. As the Virgin Islands Water and Power Authority moves into week three of their mitigation project, Island Roads Corporation continues excavating near Memorial Moravian Church on Norregatta from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. daily. Two-lane traffic continues while work is suspended during heavy traffic. Installation of duct banks and transformer pads near the Alvaro de Lugo Post Office and Hibiscus Alley continues as well. Then beginning Thursday through March 17th, Radetzgata will be closed from Main Street to the waterfront. Pedestrians will be able to access all stores. On Friday, heavy equipment and a manhole will be positioned on Radetzgata. Excavation in that area will take place this weekend nightly from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. Trenching and electrical conduits will be installed next week on Radetzgata. 21-year-old Eric Crum was arrested on February 22nd. Police say they observed a vehicle run through a stop sign in downtown Christiansted. After a traffic stop, the three occupants of the car were asked to exit, and Crump was observed with plastic baggies containing what was later field tested to be marijuana and a loaded black 25 caliber handgun inside a black bag he was holding. Also 23-year-old Odane Joseph was arrested after being linked to a gun in August 2012. Police executed a warrant at Joseph's residence in September 2012. Joseph's brother, Doriel P. Joseph, was arrested that same day when officers observed him with a firearm in his hand. The other firearm, which was found, was sent for forensic analysis, which later linked Odane Joseph to that weapon. Meanwhile, Crime Stoppers is encouraging you to do your part to make our community a safer place to live. Remember, you can do that by submitting your tips and earn a cash reward in the process. Here's this week's Crime Stoppers report starting on St. Croix on Saturday, February 16th at 3.15 p.m. Police responded to a report of shots fired in the David Hamilton Jackson Terrace housing community. Upon arrival, they found a man lying unresponsive on the ground, the victim. A 23-year-old male resident of the Basin Triangle area died as a result of several gunshot wounds. The shooter was described as a masked Hispanic male. Tell police what you know about this homicide. The minimum reward for the arrest of a murder suspect is $1,500. Now over on St. John, on Tuesday, January 1st at 1 a.m. at the sports bar located in the lumber yard, a man was standing near the restroom when another man exited the restroom and passed close to him. He felt a sharp object move against and across his body. When he checked himself, he discovered he had been cut in the upper left side of his body. Tell police what you know about this incident. The minimum reward for the arrest of the man with the knife is $900. Now over on St. Thomas on Tuesday, January 29th at 2 p.m., a man discovered that someone had stolen his Ralph Lauren 18 karat gold rose stirb Swiss watch valued at $17,000 from his home in the area of Estate Bakaroo. Help police locate the watch and the person who stole it. The minimum cash reward for the arrest of a burglar is $714 plus 10% of the retail value of property recovered. The maximum reward is $2,500. Now, police say your tips are making a difference. Continue to help making the islands a safer place to live and visit by telling them what you see about these crimes or what you know by calling Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS or log on to www.crimestoppers usvi.org. The VI Housing Finance Authority revealed their latest home ownership opportunity Tuesday on St. Croix during an unveiling ceremony. At the same time, they introduced a brand new program that will give prospective homeowners flexible options. News' Erica Parsons has that story. 
This entire area you see around me will soon be the home of the Meadows at Bon Esperance subdivision. The Housing Finance Authority's newest development for first time home buyers. But what's so special about these lots is that they're also the pilot for the Buy a Lot Build a Home program. The Buy a Lot Build a Home allows our clients to select from a design of two, three or four bedroom units and go out and get their financing and that may include some subsidy from us and uh, build their home on a lot that they have selected. Tuesday's unveiling ceremony revealed that 66 homes are up for grabs. Prospective buyers were present to look at lots and start the process towards home ownership. It is a little diff different approach because normally what we provide is a turnkey project and this gives the family some opportunity for customization. Lenders were also on site to assist with financing and housing officials say Bon Esperance will be constructed by recent graduates of the Authority's Small Contractors Program. The cost to build the homes will range anywhere from $180,000 to $220,000 depending on style and size. It is programs like these that are needed that will give Virgin Islanders ownership of a piece of the rock and develop a sense of pride and belonging. I am proud today to be here, not only because I'm a senator, but because I did what I had to do to make this happen. What's enough for me is our people will become homeowners. They will go and pay property taxes. They will have to get potable water. Erica Parsons, News 2. Now the home sites are all on quarter acre lots and are priced at 75% of the appraised value. Plans start from two bedroom, one bath homes and go all the way up to four bedroom, two bath homes. The president hit the road Tuesday to spread the word about what looming spending cuts will mean for workers. As he presses his case with the public, Republicans are arguing he should be meeting with them. The cuts are just three days away and there is no sign the two sides are even working on a deal. Danielle Nottingham reports from Washington. President Obama warned workers at Virginia's Newport News shipyard they may have to stay home without pay if Congress doesn't step in to stop automatic budget cuts. This work, along with hundreds of thousands of jobs, uh, are currently in jeopardy because of politics in Washington. The cuts, set to kick in March 1st, will take a $46 billion chunk out of the Defense Department's budget. Shipyard employees listening to the president are preparing for the worst. If I'm one of those that gets laid off, I'm trying to figure out how I would continue to go and earn my money to pay for college. If Congress and the president can't come up with a budget compromise, it's not just big Navy shipbuilders who will be affected. Those automatic cuts are expected to trickle down. Pedro Alfonso employs 120 uh, workers to install have, uh, communications fiber. Uh, He's already been notified some of his government contracts will be put on hold. Well, we thought sequestration wouldn't happen. No way it could happen. They're going to solve this. All of a sudden, it becomes real. House Republicans are pointing the finger at the president. Where's the president's plan uh, to avoid the sequester? Have you seen one? I haven't seen one. All I've heard is that he wants to raise taxes again. The president wants to see a mix of new tax revenue and targeted spending cuts. Republicans agreed to raise taxes in the fiscal cliff deal last month, and they say that's enough. Danielle Nottingham, News 2. Meanwhile, keeping our eye on the economy, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke is telling Congress that the Fed's low interest rate policies are helping the still struggling economy. In his semi-annual testimony before lawmakers, Bernanke also said that the Fed will continue its efforts to keep interest rates low. He acknowledged that the Fed's aggressive program to buy treasuries and mortgage bonds could eventually ignite inflation or unsettle investors, but says those risks are low right now. A new survey also finds Americans' confidence in the economy rebounded this month, following three straight months of declines. This is a New York Stock Exchange with Scotiabank Stock Market Watch, the Dow, NASDAQ, S&P all up. The Dow 115, NASDAQ 13, S&P 9. Coming up on News 2, don't miss our Black History Moment. Plus, we've been hearing a lot of stories about whale sightings because it's the season. But up next, a whale of a tale. The story of efforts to save a 25-ton humpback whale. We'll be right back.
Rescue efforts were made by DPNR's Fish and Wildlife Division this weekend to save a 25-ton humpback whale who was stranded in the Great Pond Bay area on St. Croix. The rescue started on Saturday to try to move the whale out of shallow waters, but sadly ended on Sunday when the whale died. News News' Janisha John brings us more about the rescue efforts. It was a rescue effort that came as a surprise on Saturday as the Department of Planning and Natural Resources Fish and Wildlife Division received word that a 35-foot humpback whale was stranded in the Great Pond Bay area. We received a call about 9.30 um, from our enforcement office that there was a whales, uh, possible whale stranding out at Great Pond. Halfway to Great Pond Bay, it was confirmed that there was a whale on the reef. Um, and we, so we continued on. Uh, we got down to the beach and went out to assess the whale, determine what the conditions were and whether or not we were going to be able to do anything. Contact was initially made to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, who along with trained DPNR officials, determined that the best solution would be to try to persuade the 25-ton whale to move out of the shallow area. We have you know, a number of individuals that in the community and also myself along with Dr. Coles that have long time experience working with marine mammals and, and sea turtles and stranding situations. We managed to persuade the whale to move on down towards the mouth of Great Pond Bay um, and then uh, something happened and she she panicked and put herself up onto the reef um, and at that point she she died and it was a, a recovery uh, project after that. Despite not being able to save the whale, officials feel that overall their efforts as a team was successful. It was excellent. I, you know, I can't commend Dr. Coles, uh, Officer Howard Forbes for DE enforcement, for the PNR. Uh, they handled the scene very well. They got everything lined up properly. And I don't think it could have gone smoother. I mean, everyone understood very clearly this is what we're doing, this is what we're trying to do, and it was a great operation from that perspective. It's just unfortunate that the whale didn't survive. Janisha John, News 2. Now the public is encouraged to contact 911 if you've ever encountered stranded marine animals as well as DPNR's Sea Turtle Stranding Network at 690-0474 if stranded sea turtles are found. Well, in tonight's segment in our Black History Moment, we spotlight jazz great Louis Armstrong. Armstrong was born August 4, 1901 to a poor family in New Orleans, Louisiana. He got an early introduction to music when he attended the Fisk School for Boys, but later learned a lot more from older musicians. Armstrong was a foundational influence in jazz as an inventive trumpet and cornet player. He's also well known for his gravely singing voice. Armstrong died in 1971, but received numerous awards and honors before and after his death. He was awarded the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, and his song, West End Blues, is listed in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Some of his more famous songs include Hello Dolly, Mac the Knife, and What a Wonderful World. Stick around, your news to AccuWeather forecast is coming up next.